Okay, so welcome everyone to the next in the series of the PPMA webinars. Uh, my name is Jill Parker and I'm a Vice President of PPMA, but also I'm Assistant Director for HR and Communications at the City of Doncaster Council. So just before we start, there's just a couple of um, housekeeping points. If you can keep yourselves on mute, unless you're wanting to ask a question, that would be great. The session itself is going to be recorded, but only the speakers will be shown. And there will be an opportunity at the end to ask any questions. If during the session uh, you want to put anything in the chat box, please do, and we'll try and pick those up as well. And if we actually do run out of time, we will follow up on any questions that are asked. Because again, this is about uh, sharing our learning and our experience. So it gives me great pleasure in welcoming you today on behalf of PPMA to hear from Alexis Curtis Harris, who is the Head of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. And she's going to be talking on the subject around diversity in the public sector and what has changed since George Floyd's death. So over to you, Alexis. Thank you so much, Jill. And uh, and yeah, welcome everybody. Um, so lovely to see so many of you here. So as Jill said, I'm Alexis Curtis Harris. Um, my pronouns are she and her. And again, as Jill said, I'm the head of equality, diversity and inclusion for Penna, focused on attraction and communication. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today um, is an bit of a recap of an event that we ran last November, sorry, last October for Black History Month. Um, as a second generation Caribbean and a British born Jamaican, uh, Black History Month is always important to me. And so the theme last year was time for change, action, it's not words. So at the time we felt it was important for us to kind of look back on what has changed, um, what action had actually been made since the height of the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020, um, if any change and progression had actually been made. Um, so this was an event that we ran in partnership for inclusive companies. Um, I don't know if any of you who are on this call today actually did come to the event. It was an in-person event at our Penna offices. It was fantastic. Um, we had so many amazing guest speakers there. We had some real diversity in the room. We had a lots of people from the black community, many who were allies as well. And the event was a really important one for me. Important for me, um, both personally and professionally. So both as the head of EDI, but also as a black woman. Um, and for me and for many others, I'm sure, the conversation around kind of race, and in this case, Black Lives Matter, is so, so important. And it isn't about white versus black. It's about everybody versus racists. And racism is, it's not a problem to fix as a black person, it's, it's not something I can fix alone and black people can't be expected to fix a problem that they essentially didn't create in the first place. And more and more, especially over the last couple of years, we're seeing people engaging with race issues in a way that, that never we really have before, which is, which is truly amazing. And over the last two years, I've seen more and more people kind of wanting to learn new things, and I've had people a lot of the times kind of wanting to talk to me as well about my own experiences. But before we get into the session, I kind of just wanted to, to say, I say this a lot at my kind of sessions, that it's important to just acknowledge that my experience, for example, are just that, they're my own. Um, diversity isn't tokenism and relying on one or, or two black people to represent the experiences of everybody. Um, I always say to people, I'm not a teacher, I'm not a therapist, I'm not Google, uh, but I do personally love sharing and sharing my own experiences. Um, but we just need to remember as individuals that not every black person does want to do this and that's okay. If they do, it's a privilege, but it should never be an expectation. So I guess back to the event and, and why we ran it. Yes, of course, it was Black History Month, but the event focused on a particular pivotal moment in time. 2020 was a year of so much change for so many reasons, but we were faced with a situation that was just essentially all too familiar. And on the 25th of May, George Floyd's life was taken away from him in the most inhumane way. And the entire world looked on as he fought to take his last breath and very, very rightly so, this sent shockwaves around the world and people were upset, they were exhausted, they were in this endless cycle of, of hopelessness and helplessness. And 
essentially his murder saw society forced to acknowledge the institutional racism that does exist. And so we saw new heights and calls for action. But you could kind of ask why then, because racism has always existed and it wasn't new. And in fact, when I talk to people sometimes, many don't actually know that even the Black Lives Matter movement wasn't new. It started in 2013 after the acquittal of Trayvon, Mar Trayvon Martin's um, murderer. And even that isn't nearly as far back as we could go to understand the cries for action to bring a level of equality for the black community. But that time, that moment in time, we were in lockdown. Um, COVID had forced us into a situation where we basically had no choice but to open our eyes, to look, to see, um, to listen, to acknowledge. And so after the murder of George Floyd, um, the world basically woke up and was beginning to actually pay attention. And that's where Black Lives Matter reached unimaginable heights. Um, and as I'm sure many of you know, um, Black Lives Matter is a statement, it's not an argument. And I think when people turn that into an argument, we're essentially arguing they don't. So that situation, that murder was a point in time, but it doesn't define the journey. And so we're always looking at how we can keep work progressing and the journey continuing. And from an organizational point of view, um, many employers kind of promise to commit to understanding and removing the barriers to racial equality and how organizations were continuing that conversation. So obviously the event that we ran as we, as we kind of stated at the start was around what's changed specifically in the public sector. So why were we focusing on the public sector you might ask? And I guess first we wanted to understand if there was a difference in how EDI was progressing between the public sector and the private sector. Now for me, I work with clients in both sectors and I understand that the experiences of working there are different, but the core issues are the same. For both, um, EDI is a priority. There's no question about it. But I think for the public sector, we know it's about representation to ensure that adequate support for our local communities or inclusion and effectiveness from a policy perspective. What we often see in the private sector is we see representation to support a more inclusive um, workforce or to reduce groupthink, but usually underlying that is profit. So each of these sectors, in my view, has kind of lessons that the other can benefit from. And again, what we sometimes see is in the public sector, there's so much policy, it can sometimes create barriers or even slow things down. And in the private sector, there can sometimes be essentially the opposite, and there can be a lack of policy. And process without policy just isn't sustainable. But I think it's, it's safe to say that the public sector, I think, has certainly been challenged recently and was thrust into the forefront of the battle against the pandemic and the need to represent their communities has essentially grown even more. And what we're seeing in a positive way is that voices for change are becoming louder and nobody can ignore them anymore. So touching on the session or the event, should I say, um, there were so many key takeaways and learnings. We had some exceptional speakers that we were just so privileged to be joined by. We, we started off the day with um, Doug Me, who's our director of Penis' Ex Search Practice. Um, and he shared some really kind of revealing statistics. And basically he mentioned there was an article published in 2020, uh, 2010, asking why there were so few non-white local authority chief execs in the country. Um, and the 2011 census basically reported that 65% of London's population is non-white British and approximately 90,000 people work in the government serving that population. But something that really stood out to me was he'd talked about the fact that 12 years ago, there were two black chief execs in London and when we got to that point last year, he'd mentioned that there were only four. So in the space of 12 years, we only made a small bit of progress and we need to progress faster. 
On the day, again, we then had um, Jenny Rowlands, who's the Chief Exec of London Borough of Camden, and she's also the lead for EDI for London Councils. And she shared some of the really great work that is being done over there to improve equality for black colleagues. So they have done things like anonymised recruitment, um, ensuring that there's no all white shortlist for roles that are above 50K or more. They're running mandatory anti-racism training um, and I think she mentioned I think it was 82% of their staff have already gone through that um, and she told us of the areas that she was really proud of for instance they have this organization called recruitment volunteers and, and they come and support in recruitment processes and recruitment panels to kind of see what's happening and making sure that everything is as inclusive as possible on the next part of the day, we had a fireside chat and I was lucky enough to kind of host that with a couple of guests. And we essentially included some insight here from the private sector for a little bit of inspiration. So we were joined by Carolyn Frankham, who's the Global Chief Exec Officer for um, a company called Cantar. And we were also joined by Wayne Brown, who is the Deputy Chief Fire Officer at West Midlands Fire Service. And actually both of those organizations, Cantar and West Mids Fire, um, Fire Service were placed in the inclusive top 50 UK employers list. So it was really great to be able to hear from two people who are leaders in organizations that are making real change and doing things really, really well. So Caroline from Kantar, she kind of talked a lot about the employee research groups that have been created there to improve inclusion, um, diversity and equality at Kantar. Um, and each of those groups she talked about had an assigned chief exec sponsor. Um, so she also kind of talked about the impact that those groups are making. Um, their commitment to setting clear short-term targets and, and measuring process. Um, and I've got a quote here from her. She said, it can be great to bring diverse talent into the organisation, but you must support them to succeed once they're in. We're talking about breaking down barriers and structural discrimination that's been inherent in our sector for years. And it takes people in our position to make a difference. And I just thought that was a really good way of kind of showcasing how she has taken her position in leadership really, really seriously to support um, the overcoming of a, of a non-inclusive culture. Wayne then kind of talked a bit about how in West Midlands, they've created these spaces called Brave Spaces. Um, and they're led by their internal networks, which kind of are centered around education. Education is at their core. And he talked about the fact that in the fire service, um, they are a predominantly white male environment. So that focus on education is really, really important. Um, he also kind of shared with us, and I don't know if this resonates with anybody here or anybody has tried this or is, is doing this in their organizations, but his use of positive action and the use of the Equality Act, in particular, Section 159. And he talked with great pride about how he's implemented that and how now when they run recruitment processes, if they have two people who are of equal merit, um, have the same score, are at the very, very final stage of recruitment process, they use section 159, 159 to enable them to choose somebody based on their protected characteristic. And actually he mentioned that they are the only fire service in the country doing that and that they are fully transparent about what they're doing, that it has been quite contentious, um, but the way they overcome that contention is just by being open and honest and true to themselves and focusing on what they want to achieve, which is for them to be the most diverse fire service in the UK. The final guest that we had, who I sat on a panel with actually was, Jeff Booth, who is the chief, um, chief superintendent of the Met Police. And he talked about his role in helping to support and create structural change within the police service. And he was very, very open and honest and told us that for him, one of the biggest challenges that he faces within his organization is that there are many, many departments that want to do what they have always done. And that might resonate with lots of people. 
So what Jeff is doing is setting up a community outreach fund so that underrepresented organisations are paid for their DNI support that they provide to them. Um, he's also kind of looking at how they can create kind of charitable arms for the Met to incentivize private organizations to continue to contribute to those efforts. And his real kind of point that stuck with me was that you just can't keep doing the same thing. You've got to be one step ahead of the game to keep moving things forwards. So with all those kind of fantastic guests that I've just mentioned there, there were so many lengthy and invaluable discussions that were really, really important topics that were discussed on the day. Um, for instance, there was a, a lengthy discussion about the fact that we have lots and lots of DNI initiatives across the UK, but people were kind of saying, well, London seems to be ahead of the curve. Now, for me, a key point to acknowledge is that Britain's diversity is much more complex than it seems. Some areas are, of course, in the country more diverse, and I think we can probably say London is, is the most ethnically diverse, which means that usually when we're recruiting in London, we are able to engage with a much more diverse audience and we often see more success. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's easier. And there are still barriers and in a lot of that lack of access to opportunity for individuals that doesn't only exist outside of London. So the general consensus in the room was that it shouldn't be an excuse for others not to try based on the fact that they are not obviously in London. We also had um, a number of speakers who spoke about how the murder of George Floyd had opened up not just the space of hearing in their organisations, but rehearing what we may be doing, but perhaps we were uncomfortable to revisit. So many organisations have been focused on EDO for well over the past two years, um, but possibly haven't progressed as much as they wanted to. And systems were working how they were meant to work because they have had structural discrimination baked into them for many, many years. So this moment in time was a real wake up call to many organizations, many sectors, many leaders. And there was a real consensus in the room. That some leaders, they had taken the easy option of not saying anything, which again, is, is not acceptable. And Many people who combated this did this with, by creating kind of safe spaces, safe sharing sessions and a place that anybody can join and you can join even if you just want to listen. But the key focus and linking to what I mentioned Wayne had said earlier is that they were about education. They were a place for everybody to learn, to educate together and to go on that journey together. And, and I always kind of say that when we're talking about EDI, diversity inclusion whatever we want to call it that it doesn't matter where you're starting on your journey but the key key thing is that you move forward and ensure that all part staff um, all employees are part of that journey and and that is a progressive journey so when we spoke and put this to the room there was a lot of organizations who had said that they had held these types of sessions but then when we asked what actions had been taken forward around 50 percent of the time the answer was nothing they weren't doing anything they treated these sessions as a place to have empathy for black colleagues but there was no real action and we need both for many kind of leaders in the room as well they they talked about leading by example and challenging unapologetically and challenging the sector to be better and some key things that came out was that it's, it's never about settling where you're at. It's always, always striving to be better. And for many of our allies in the room, they felt it was about listening to what people are saying, actively and truly listening. Yes, it's about speaking up, but it's never about speaking over. And then another really key area that I wanted to kind of touch on before um, looking at the kind of key takeaways, the five kind of key main points to kind of take away was a discussion that was had about the disparity of diversity and how 
for many organizations, you see a lot of diversity at what we say like the lower levels, but it peters out and it gets less and less the more senior you get. And actually, again, as someone who works across both sectors, that's a challenge across the board. Now, maybe that's a skill set challenge, or maybe there are other challenges and reasons for that. But the, the point in the, the main topic of discussion in the room was why can't we grow our own? Why can't we upskill our, our existing individuals, our existing staff, inspire them to want to stay with you and to progress through the ranks? If we have great people in an organization, whatever their skill or even confidence level, we can increase these elements and increase representation. So the takeaway there was about taking advantage and nurturing what we already have in our organizations. So on the day as well, to end the event, I was kind of put on the spot, I will be honest, um, but I was asked to give kind of five simple takeaways that anybody can do to start their journey or start making progression in the right direction. So the five things that I, that I talked through, which I wanted to share with you all today was number one is acknowledgement and taking accountability. So acknowledging and understanding your own privileges no matter what they are, because every single one of us has privilege in some way. Um, acknowledging where things are in your workplace um, or things that you might see that maybe are not as inclusive as they should be. And having that courage to hold yourself and others accountable. So that's acknowledging where you are personally and where your organization is on their own DNI journey. The second point was around education and awareness raising. So I'm a big believer that we all have the ability to educate ourselves or to seek out education in this space. More and more as we progress over time, there are so many tools out there that we can use for education. There's blogs, social media, events, webinars like this one. And I've certainly seen, as I mentioned earlier, there can sometimes be that reliance on people from marginalized groups to be the spokespeople and to educate those around them um, and as I kind of mentioned at the start it's not okay and actually can become quite exhausting so I'd say please go out there do what you can to build your understanding and to learn of course it's okay to ask people questions and ask to share their lived experiences if they want to and if they are comfortable to do so but it shouldn't be the expectation so be curious and learn but build your own cultural intelligence as well. The third point was about um, listening and changing processes to support progression. So a step that companies can take is to always ask questions and always listen. Um, get your colleagues, get your employees involved at every step of your journey. And that can not only help you measure the impact of your initiatives, but it can allow you to identify the measures that employees from those underrepresented groups value the most. We sometimes see a bit of a disparity or a gap between implementation and meaningful impact. And so by consistently listening, engaging, if what we're doing is working is really, really important. Number four is examine your recruitment and stop focusing on fit. When we look at people who fit or ask people to fit a culture, we result in an unhealthy monoculture. And actually that is detrimental to creating inclusive workplaces. Um, there is power in difference. And that emphasis that often we see on culture fit can inadvertently push people to try to fit in what, for what is there already, meaning they lose their own identities. And what we want is for people to add to your culture, to feel they can be authentic, to bring their true identity to work. And then just the final fifth one is the most important thing I would say. It's great to have conversations, but what you need to do is listen and have the right intention. So the fifth one is about measurable action. Without action, and as I say, measurable action, we're never going to progress. And another final thing is that action is not a one-time thing. It's continuous, it's evolutionary, and even after you act, you start again, you evaluate, you analyze, you listen, and you act again. So I'm just looking at the time now, and I wanted to kind of allow time for questions, but there was just one thing which I'm just gonna find that 
Wayne, if you remember, who is from the um, West Midlands Fire Service, he gave this analogy on the day and it has stuck with me to this day. Um, and so I just wanted to share it with you as the final point of the day, given the kind of topic that we've obviously discussed. So he said, as a black man, I carry a rucksack on my back every day and it's really heavy, but I don't want someone to carry my rucksack for me. What I want is for you to understand that my rucksack is really heavy and that at times I need you to speak up and be there alongside me or offer different levels of assistance because actually that can make my rucksack a bit lighter. We all have a rucksack, every single one of us, but never underestimate the value of your allyship. Sometimes I'm really tired of having to carry my rucksack around. And so by someone just standing up and speaking up, this can make my rucksack a lot lighter for me. And so I just wanted to finish on that because as I say, I've worked in this space a long time. I've heard a lot of analogies and that stuck with me to this very day. Um, so I will stop there and pause and just thank you for your time and open up the floor if there's any questions at all. Oh, I can see the questions here. So I'll, I'll, so someone said, I was at the event. It was brilliant, thought provoking and inspiring. Wonderful. Um, which fire service? That's West Midlands Fire Service. Um, how can organisations authentically reach underrepresented communities? I mean, the answer is there's no short answer. There's no one size fits all approach to that. But reaching underrepresented communities, to, to begin with, it's about understanding the individuals first. We can make assumptions. Um, we can try to understand what people want, what people are looking for. But without that research and evidence-based approach to tapping into the motivations, the behaviours, the perceptions, the misperceptions, you will never reach authentically. So... In my role, when we're looking at, again, how can we engage with communities, it's about speaking and listening to people first, doing that research, as I say, understanding what's going on, and then looking at how we can tap into those motivations and reach them in their own spaces. And, and that can be anything through serving advertising in the right place to more long-term things like outreach initiatives or upskilling initiatives and things like that. Um, so if you did want to find out a bit more about how you can kind of reach communities and communicate with communities in a more authentic way, do kind of reach out to me um, as well. And uh, yeah, I'm sure I'll be able to support you there as well. Uh, oh, somebody's LinkedIn, Wayne, there as well, as I say, a very, very insightful man. Um, uh, what can local authorities do to better support EDI leads and bed in DNI culture change? So I was actually alongside inclusive companies, lucky enough to have been a judge at um, both the inclusive awards and the inclusive top 50 companies. So it was really great to kind of partner with them again on this piece of work. And I think something that is imperative to organizations to um, make this um, support available is to ensure that support is coming from leadership, that it's not left to people on always on the ground to, to make change. Um, leadership, and that can come in many guises, should always be involved every step of the way, but actively evolved. I've worked with organizations where leadership are involved as in they're in the room, but they're not driving change. And I think that's a really important thing to ensure that culture change is authentic, but that it also is driven through all areas. Um, what are your thoughts on working with more junior and often bigger numbers of black, Asian, ethnic minority staff? What are your thoughts on working with more junior? So, sorry, do you, what, Tamsin, sorry, I'm just reading your question. Do you mean, do I believe it's a positive thing um, or how do you do that? Um, just your thoughts sorry. on whether we should direct our efforts towards them or because the res 
doesn't really focus on that and therefore it guides us to focus on you know who's going from middle management to senior management for instance sure. and the promotion and development of those um, groups of staff whereas the staff network felt they wanted to reach out and support the people who didn't really have a voice yeah yeah no really important point and I think um so to answer the question yes absolutely that's important I think what we again we often see and I, I touched on it earlier is that actually when we look at bringing in a more junior um cohort we do often see a lot more diversity but it's how do we nurture that and upskill that and that can be through a number of different tactics it can be through upskilling programs it could be through confidence building programs um, but I think something else that I see working well is reverse mentoring as well and actually how can we support not just junior but more senior people as well to learn from each other and to partner on this journey and, and linking to the, the point someone else asked earlier about embedding um, a DNI culture and culture change, that's again another good way to, to do that as well. Thank you. Uh, someone else is really helpful. I think there's an onus on us all to keep the challenge up so our peers and colleagues engage. I would have hoped to see more coalition across the campus today. Yes, so I think that's a good point. Maybe a thought for the PPMA conference uh, where there's an opportunity for face-to-face -face conversations. Absolutely. And actually, if anyone is at that conference, I am there as well um, doing a talk with my colleague, Tristan. So I hope to meet lots of you face-to-face -face if you're there as well. Yeah. Uh, again, I can just add, I think that's a really important point. And as a PPMA uh, member, I'll certainly be uh, taking that back for further discussion. And just an interesting point on the reverse mentoring. Um, myself and my own organisation, we practice that uh, with our senior officers and elected members. And, and it, it's such a good way to learn more because everybody can be learning every day. It doesn't matter uh, at what level you're at. So, I, again, I think that's a really positive point that you've mentioned there. OK, any final questions for Alexis? Uh, thank you very much for the ones that you've given so far. We're just about out of time. No, just if there's any more, you can follow up, of course. And as Alexis says, if you come into the, the conference in April, that's fantastic. We can continue these fantastic conversations. So really, I just want to say thank you very much for your participation today. I hope you found that helpful and as uh, valuable as I have. And also thank you to Alexis for your uh, valuable insight and also to share your experience and learning. I think it's been brilliant. So. Thank you very much, everybody, and do look out for our future webinars. Hope you found them helpful. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone.